and we think about God's um, uh, rule and his will, <clears throat> rather than my reputation, my rule, my will, immediately we, we see right from there that he's inviting us to pursue those things and then to recognize that we then turn to God for the basic needs that we have. We recognize our, our, our dependence upon him, but we, and we pray for those things, and then we move on from there. But the, the fact is that the, even there, the model for prayer turns out to be not anthropocentric, but theocentric. It's very much centered around God first, rather than myself. It's very significant. He starts off with his, his reputation, his rule, his, his, his will, not my own. And then that will give me a context in which we are, I can see my own. Now, <clears throat> I will say this. <clears throat> Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You all familiar with that verse? But you see, it's when you are delighting in the Lord that your desires are his desires. You see the concept there? So there he sanctifies your desires when you're making him your chief uh, source of pleasure. When you make him your, your source of true delight, uh, then you discover that what you ask for is what he would want for you. This is why Augustine said, love God and do as you please. Yeah. What did he mean by that? It means when you are loving God, what you please is what would be pleasing to him. That's the stuff of heaven. Because that will be the course of heaven, will be all that. Then when you see him face to face... You will always want to do what he pleases because you'll finally fully realize that everything he wants for you was always for your good after all. So it would be madness not to desire that. There was another th question I thought. <coughs> uh, John? In addition to contextualization that you talk about, uh, isn't part of the answer to these questions the fact that some truths have to be de -hussed? In other words, God wants us to work harder for some truths to understand them in the asking, seeking, and knocking process. Yeah. Because we can't handle all the truth anyway. Yeah. You can't, yeah. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> that stupid line. You knew I was going to say that, Robert. <laughs> A few good men. Yeah. It's so good that you didn't test for the role before Nicholson did. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give me a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's true that the uh, fact is that uh, we cannot fully grasp all these things. We kind of we live into them, we learn into them, uh, and we lean into them. How's that? Um, but the idea is that you are developing uh, a way of seeing and recognizing that God's not going to give you all the truth because you're not ready for it. It's true. One step at a time, he'll illuminate your pathway one step at a time. But the key is this. The uh, imagery, remember that from Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. You're all familiar with that. There's a, there used to be a TV show with that name. Um, and... Um, this image is a very rich one indeed, and it's a good image for your life and mine in this world. Think about the ancient Near East. Think about a moonless night. And you sure didn't have anything really by the way of artificial light to speak of. And suppose you are going on a journey. You, you, um, normally they don't want to travel at night because it's treacherous, but suppose you find yourself in, 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 in the darkness. You have a lamp. It's got a wick olive oil and it and this um, this lamp as you make a step what will it do it will illuminate the next step so you take one step and the lamp then reveals what the next step to take and then only when you take that next step will it illuminate the next step but you can see what it's like it will never illuminate two or three steps at once it'll only illuminate what you need at the time but you will not get more light if you stop moving so you have to keep stepping into the light and as you step into the light then he can reveal the next step and that's why life is not a painting but it is a film it's more like a film where it's revealed one frame at a time rather than as the whole and that is the journey we take. And each frame you might think of as a day. And so he reveals each frame at a time. And so 
the idea then is that as we take those steps, then he illuminates our, our pathway. Now, the time will come where the lamp is no longer necessary. Uh, uh, Peter uh, says that this um, word we have is a, a lamp shining in a dark place, the word of God, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Isn't that a beautiful image? Think about that. what that's saying. You have a lamp, and you're in a dark place now, and this, we are in this present darkness, this shadow lands. But the day will come where the day will dawn, and the morning star will arise in your heart. That, that idea, the morning star will arise. So imagine then, Joe, you've got to lose some weight there, I no, think. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing here, they're breaking the chair here. <laughs> Use that. <laughs> <laughs> Just giving you a hard time, buddy. <laughs> I deserve it. <laughs> I deserve it. <laughs> but just think what that means. Imagine how foolish it would appear to be if you carried that lamp in the in the fullness of the day, in the brightness of the day. It would be idiotic. You see, you wouldn't even be able to see the light. Do you see what he's saying here? The day will come when you will no longer ask me any question. Right now, I cannot reveal all things, but the day will come where you will see, not in a, through a glass darkly, but then face to face. You'll, it'll be fully illuminated, and then you won't need the lamp. You'll see him then, in that straight up way. Mm. I, I often find it's so much easier to see, I guess it's an advantage to getting uh, a little bit older, because you can see uh, God's leading when you, when you look in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. You can look back <clears throat> and think about times that were so difficult in your life and you realize that that what God was leading you through that and that was the path you had to take to get where you are. Yes. You otherwise wouldn't have been able to get there. Yeah. And it's an encouragement to look back on that because you don't know why you're going through what you're going through now, but you know, <coughs> again, this is the path that you have to take to get where he wants you to where go. Where he wants you to go, yes. And that's, that's, a, that's uh, something we can't determine. And he knows that you need to go through this so that we will ask, seek, and knock. And there are going to be th times when he and his grace will give us severe mercies to drive us to, uh, to grace, to drive us to need, to force us to, into awareness of our desperation. And we are all desperate men, but we rarely admit it. It's when we admit our desperation, when, it's when we admit our need, that we then are, are turned to him. Because why would a man ask, seek, and knock if they have no need? But when we have our awareness of need, that, what does that force us to do? It forces us up to look Godward, you see, and to realize, I really have already burned my bridges behind me. There's nothing in this world that can satisfy me. There's nothing in this world that can sustain me. Only you can do that. So I ask, I seek, and I knock. And you know what happens? When you ask, what does he do? He'll give you insight. When you seek, you will find. When you knock, the door is open. So this is God's way of giving you more illumination so that those severe mercies can actually drive us to a greater apprehension of grace than we would have ever had before. Now I'll begin where I left off last week. <laughs> all, all of this was nothing intentional. Yes. Ken, what was the psalm on the lamp? Psalm 119, verse 105, I think it is. Yes. You say God's got a purpose for every person's life, right? Yes. And there's nothing I can do to keep him from completing that purpose for my life. Well, we can defeat God's desires for our life. He, his desires are not the same as his plan. You understand that? God desires for all men to be saved and that they come to a knowledge of the truth. Isn't that true? Yet we can, because of the awful gift of human freedom... Awful gift it is. And when I say awful, I mean it's terrifying in its immensity, in its, in, in its possibilities, that you are a moral being who can make choices that will shape eternity. That's a terrifying thing. But having done that then, a man can say no to the purposes of God. And that is... The purpose of the desire. To the desire. Well, the purposes of, the, of God in terms of his desires. And then what happens is they reject God's purpose for their life. So I can do something to... Yes, you can. Them from completing that purpose. Yes, you life. can. Uh, because God does not want to force you into his purpose no. for your life. Yeah. It is a synergy. It's a divine human synergy. Now, there's a mystery here of the sovereignty of God at the end of the day. 
uh, it will have been God's plan. But it will, you know, that's another matter. Um, but there is a, a, it's a very, very important truth. In fact, there's a scripture that describes it. And these were men who rejected God's purpose for their lives. You see, the, the pain of love is the vulnerability of rejection. And that if God loves someone and they spurn him, that is painful. And just as we know, it is for us. But what is love if it's not something that...